Y'all better get used to our faces because not only do you get a beautiful segment of us preaching on, on this, on this Wednesday, but it's a special week because the NFL draft is here. We have NFL content. It is bike and we will be live streaming for the entirety of the NFL draft. I'm going to repeat that because I'm not sure you guys heard that the entirety of the fucking NFL draft, the entire first round, the entire second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round. I don't know. I can't promise you we'll still be here by like the fifth and sixth and seventh (laughs) round, but we're going to try our very, very hardest to live stream draft analysis throughout. Uh, I will preface by saying we cannot actually put the draft on uh, on our screen because YouTube will take us down immediately, but we will be, you know, you could watch it on your TV, just mute your TV and listen to us on YouTube. That's probably best case scenario. So we will be here Thursday, Friday, Saturday, up on the channel. Make sure you got notifications on. But as soon as the draft kicks off, we'll be live to hang with y'all. And we'll be bringing on special guests and shit throughout the entirety of uh, of the draft to get different pieces of analysis and hopefully keep y'all entertained because this has been a long time coming. I'm ready for it. I know the boys are ready for it. Today, we are looking at some DraftKings over under in terms of where specific players are being put right now on the draft board draft board per Vegas so like for instance like two is over unders at five and a half do we think he's going to get picked earlier than five and a half or over five and a half so you know picks five six whatever Uh, so we're gonna look at some of the over unders we're gonna look at like realistic landing spots for each guy and by position we're gonna look at like which player makes the most sense at different teams you know if Denver needs a wide receiver who makes the most sense there and how it affects the other players and then lastly we have a a really really dope sheet that was put together by Addison Hayes or someone might have put it together before him and then he shared it with us which we will link you guys to down below if you want to follow along or you want to put it onto Excel to uh, maneuver around it yourselves it actually takes all of the teams and then it takes all the college players and shows you how many visits that each team had with specific positions, specific players. So it'll tell you like Arizona met with, you know, four wide receivers. It won with CD lamb. They met him at the combine or they met him at a private visit or whatever. So it's very, very contextual. It'll give you a lot more context to whether or not a team likes them or what positions that we can expect them to be drafting for the NFL draft. So today's going to be fucking jam packed. I think we should kick the, uh, I think we should kick the show off with, the intro obviously hit that shit first after the intro was concluded what i think we should really start this off with is uh, a few bold predictions i want to hear if you guys have any bold predictions for we could say the draft in general or the first round and i tweeted out what I think my bold prediction will be for the first round. Everyone's getting super fucking pumped up about Jonathan Taylor, about DeAndre Swift. Are there going to be any running backs to go in the first round, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there will be one running back picked in the first round. His name will not be Jonathan Taylor. His name will not be DeAndre Swift. It'll be J.K. Dobbins, and he's going to go to Miami. That will will shock the fantasy world, but I will not be surprised if that is what I see happen on our tv screens thoughts uh i actually would not be surprised uh that much either because a lot of like buzz around the nfl circles is saying that jk dobbins is like their guy and they're like probably one of the ones that actually have enough capital to blow and waste a cap pick on a running back that early yeah i think uh clyde edwards alaire might even fall to the first round also there's a lot of hype about that guy and he only had like one year of production but what he did on like the biggest stage against like alabama and the national championship you think, game, you think I clyde think he, can end up in the first round i think he might fall the first or go into the first really i think so yeah, there's I mean, like, the a way, lot of talk the, about it the way i the way i think about it is you know the dolphins if they're going to use a first round pick on a running back like it's really just their preference it doesn't fucking yep. matter what we think on twitter if they like jk dobbins a little bit more than swift then he's going to end up being the guy so someone commented on it i think it was sexy pass commented afterwards or no i think it was danny whatever um if that happens say jk goes in the first and like taylor goes in the second deandre swift goes in the second i think the scenario he gave was taylor to pittsburgh in the second uh swift to the falcons in the second so we have dobbins first to miami those two in the second how would that mess up your your running back rankings? Like that becomes so difficult. I don't know if it moves anyone particularly for me, but it definitely puts Dobbins right into that like elite tier, you know? 
Yeah, I don't think it moves anyone for me other than maybe Dobbins leaps ahead of Acres, depending on where Acres goes. But I think if JT goes to Steelers, love that. Swift goes to Falcons, fucking love that. So so good. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm there with Mike. My main concern with Dobbins, and we touched on it on the exclusive videos you can find in the Discord, recently closed, by the way. Uh, it was it was basically him struggling with a poor offensive line and with an immobile quarterback. And right now, that's kind of the case in Miami. They have a lot of chips to build up that offensive line and hopefully in the future add a quarterback. So the situation can obviously get better. But if those are landing spots for JT and Swift, I'd probably just leave Dobbins uh, as the third man out in that rotation. Yeah, um, I, I think... I forgot that I had Acres above Dobbins, but this would definitely move Dobbins above Acres. Just the first round draft capital has to yep. push, you know, have to has to push some weight after Dobbins didn't really perform at the combine. You know, he didn't do any of the tests besides bench press, so we're kind of left, you know, with minimal data besides the production that we saw in college. So that gives us another piece, a uh, very positive piece for a guy like Dobbins in terms of his analysis. All right, so you guys want to jump into the next uh, part of this video? Kind of take it away for me. Sure. Yeah, you got, you don't want to hear our bold predictions? What the fuck, man. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, I, I haven't hopped on with you guys. Sometimes I forget you're there. I just, I'm, I'm very good at just talking to a camera. That's all I do uh, all day. My bold prediction might not be that bold anymore, but I think Henry Ruggs is the first wide receiver off the board. What are the odds, right? Do they have odds on who the first one is, wide receiver was? Yeah, so right now the odds are still favored for CD and Jerry Judy. They're at okay. over under 12 and a half. Henry Ruggs at 13.5. But just given, like, just given this whole, like, speed kills narrative and all that hoobla, like, I, I said this as kind of a joke a while back, but now I'm just like, the more I think about it, the more I can see it, especially with that recent hype about the Chiefs wanting to move up and take him too. I think that's going to drive his price up, 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 and up. And someone's going to just like jump up and leap and take him. I was going to say, we talk, and I'm sure we'll get into it. We talk so much about KC running back landing spots, but like realistically, they don't have much behind fucking Tyreek Hill. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a wide receiver go there, there pretty early. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine trying to defend against Henry Ruggs, Tyreek Hill, Michael Hardman? <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about McCall Hardman too much. Maybe not even rugs based on all these uh, <laughs> analytics guys. Uh, my bold prediction is seven wide receivers go round one. I think the top Woo! four guys that we have listed, CD Lamb, Judy, Ruggs, Jefferson go. I also think Rager might go. I also think Ayuk may go just based on the hype. And I think mm -hmm. Denzel Mims might sneak his way into the end of the first round. I could see it happening. Yeah, I feel like early on in the offseason, the over-under was set at like four and a half for the first round. Now that number is almost like – over under four and a half for the top like 20 picks. Like I could see yeah. four to five going within, you know, the top 20 or 21 picks. And then I feel like that range, the 20 to 32 always ends up being like a bunch of wide receivers kind of just like thrown into the mix. Cause you have like championship caliber teams that are like one or two weapons away from being like elite offenses. And they just want to throw those guys into the mix. All right. So we have seven and a half wide receivers as the over under nose bold prediction. We got Dobbins as the first running back and the only running back first round off the board to Miami. Mike's got rugs, wide receiver one off the board. I, th I think all are very plausible. So let us know in the comment section down below, bold predictions for the first round of the NFL draft. Yeah, moving on from there, we have odds based on uh, different teams, what their best odds are for a certain position. So we might have a team like Minnesota with their best odds to be an offensive lineman or the Bills with a defensive lineman. We chose teams with the highest odds to take a skill position player. So kicking that off, we have the Denver Broncos at pick 15. Their odds to take a wide receiver with their first selection in the draft is minus 230, which is a pretty heavy favorite. Um, me personally, who I think would be a very good fit there, I think somebody like Henry Ruggs would work there. Obviously, his over-under for draft capital is going to be around there. Uh, his speed can really open things up, and that would be a pretty dynamic offense with a good running game with Melvin Gordon, even though he's not that good. Uh, back there, they also have you know Noah Fant and Cortland Sutton. That could be a pretty good offense. It's going to be cool to see Drew Locke fuck that up. So that, that would be uh, a good fit that I like to see. I also think Justin Jefferson, you know, that big slot receiver that can kind of play the second fiddle to a Cortland Sutton. And lastly, like obviously Jerry Judy, my comp for him was Emmanuel Sanders. And we kind of saw that last year with E-Man and Cortland Sutton before he got shipped off. So I'd like to see any three of those guys go. Justin Jefferson might be a little bit too high at pick 15, but I think the other two are realistic. Yeah, love that. I, I, I think Henry Ruggs would be a great fit there too. And he'd be he'd be a landing where like if he goes there, he doesn't really kill like Sutton's value. I think if anything, he lifts his value. I think anyone going there helps Sutton because it helps the overall offense. But I think he's one where like fantasy wise, he doesn't necessarily like to take a huge chunk out of Sutton, but also helps him a lot in terms of like getting him open in open space. Dude, yeah. So w let's talk about that the the trade I was texting you guys that I made today. Uh, I moved in one of my dynasty leagues, Cortland Sutton and the 311. Cortland Sutton, the 311, and Muhammad Sanu. Um, but for, you know, 
just for information's sake, we'll just leave Sinu out there because he's like got nothing. So Sutton in the 311 for Terry McLaurin, the 112, and the 303. So Sutton, when I went into the offseason, there were like – there are not a lot of guys I, I, I don't trade ever in Dynasty, but he was like my one guy on my team that I was like, I'm just going to keep him as a cornerstone of my team, and he's on the do not trade list. I don't care what you throw my way. Like Sutton, I'd rather just have a good player and let him ride out his career on my team. And that changed today because I love Terry. And I just thought the draft capital picks were just too, too much, right? Moving up from the 311 to 303 plus getting the 112 was just yeah. a lot. And I'm on, I have a team where when I drafted last year, I drafted like Cortland Sutton as a wide receiver, obviously. But I also drafted Julio Jones, Adam Thielen, who I've since moved, and like Julian Edelman. So they were great like production-wise last year. But moving forward, you know, you have to move those pieces in order to have a good dynasty team. So I'm like, I need to get some youth. 112 is like that perfect range of where – uh, of where you can get like a Denzel Mims or something in a rookie draft right now. So I'm thinking like, you know, I can have Cortland Sutton and someone at the 311 who might, you know, who know, like Donovan Peoples Jones or something, or I can have like Terry Denzel Mims and, you know, a decent player at the 303. So like, I, I want to get your guys' thoughts because the reason I moved Sutton, Drew Locke scares me, right? Like Sutton was not good in the five games that Drew Locke started. Drew Locke had one good game throwing the ball in those five games that he started. So Yes, he's like an exciting young player, and they're going to try to build their team around him, but there's absolutely no guarantee of success there. You obviously want your young wide receivers tied to good quarterbacks, mm -hmm. um, and that's not what we know with Terry either. Obviously, it was a little bit of a risk, but like uh, with Cortland Sutton, the other thing is like this wide receiver, right? They're minus 230 for that to be their first pick, right, at, at, at wide receiver. If it's not Henry Ruggs, I would say that's probably a negative for Cortland Sutton, right, because you're just putting another really good wide receiver on the field, which – you know, it makes the offense better, but at the same time, if if it's a guy that commands targets, I, I think that caps Sutton's uh, ceiling a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I had this debate with someone. I forgot who it was. But I, like, I saw me, that on Twitter, and I, I kind of agree with you, but yeah, go. Yeah, to me, it's like I think a good player makes everyone else better. Um, so, I, like, you can't go into the season with Sutton and Noah Fant as your only receivers, even if we think Drew Locke sucks or if he's not good, whatever. You got to give the guy some weapons. So, like, I think Ruggs is the best because he opens up a lot more space. But I think even having someone like Judy or someone like Lamb in their first developmental year, like, Sutton's still going to be that guy, right? Because Drew Locke has that rapport with him. And like, I wouldn't say he was bad. Like, he wasn't, he wasn't fantastic like he was earlier in the year, but he wasn't bad, right? He's still catching, like, four or five cat passes a game, like, you know, right. 60, 70 yards, which isn't horrible. Um, so like, I, I'm on the view that like, I, I do think they're going to add someone, but I don't necessarily view it as a negative for Sutton. I just have a preference for who it was, but I think all of them would be good for the offense as a whole. And if you look at like how much they ran last year, like if per Warren Sharp stats, like fucking love that site. It's dope. But in like game neutral script, like they're bottom 10 in the league in terms of passing volume. Right. So I don't know how much more they can run because they're not even that great of a team to begin with. So it's like, I think there's enough to go around and I think people are really scared of Noah Fant, but like at the end of the day, like if you're being generous, like super generous, like is Noah Fant going to hit a hundred targets? Like probably not. Man. So the, I, the I think argument like, of the yeah. Broncos adding another receiver can be made in Washington too. Like who's their second best guy. I think we were talking about it, Mike on discord. Their second leading receiver last year was like Chris Thompson with 58 receptions yeah. or 58 targets, one of the two. So they're probably going to add somebody. But when you think about it in season, right? Like, but if they add someone, it's not like they're not they're not a favorite to be like a top fifteen wide receiver pick. Like, if they do end up going with like a Judy or a or a CD, I'm gonna be like, fuck. Like, clearly they don't see Terry as the alpha. But Terry acted every every bit of the of the alpha last year. And of course, yeah. I mean the QB concerns are there for sure. But like, if he could do that with Dwayne Haskins and whoever the fuck else was the quarterback there, I I don't know. I I I'm yeah, probably I, but, way higher on Terry, but. But I but like do you think that just because they take, they take someone they don't view Cortland Sutton as the alpha? No, I don't. But I think draft capital would dictate that for me. You know, like if you're if you're taking a wide receiver in the top fifteen, you don't see Terry as a top fifteen or a, or a true wide receiver one. I think I think he's saying that you need a compliment to it or something. Otherwise, they would let Cortland be the alpha and and draft a nice wide receiver too in, in round two. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. thing is like on a week to week basis, when the season actually starts, like Terry McLaurin and Cortland Sutton aren't too far apart for like their fantasy output. Obviously Haskins and have another year under his belt. He's kind of thrown into like a shit situation like Josh Rosen was in his rookie year. So that offense can really only go up from here. Sure. Maybe the volume might not be as high as we'd like if they add another guy, but they have the number two pick. They'd have to spend a later pick than the Broncos obviously would at number 15 to add another receiver. So it wouldn't be as good of a receiver, hopefully if they know what they're do with, doing with the, when they're drafting. So yeah, I agree with you, Nick. I think that 
Uh, even if they add another receiver, I really like Terry McLaurin in this offense. And then you get a 112, and Mike and I touched on it in earlier videos. That's like Clyde Edwards, Alaire, Justin Jefferson, Denzel Mims range. You can get another young stud wide receiver to build up that receiver core for you and get more depth on top of it instead of having just one guy in Cortland Sutton. Yeah, yeah. I'm also like the trade for you. I'm I also, will say one thing though, yeah. right before you move on. Um, there's like, I would say Sutton, like when I view a player, I don't just look at the production. I also try and think about like where I think their value is going in the, in the future. I think Sutton's a lot more protected in terms of his value because he's like a Twitter darling, has all the hype or whatever. Like if he mm-hmm. has another flat year and just puts up 1K yards, I don't think his value really falls where even if he declines a little bit, I don't think his value falls as much as like, whereas Terry McLaurin, like if he, if he like stumbles, like his value is going to fucking plumb because everyone already yeah. hates him and they're just waiting for him to screw up. But on the flip side of that, if he comes out and smashes, then you have like a lot more upside. So I think it's like a big risk reward trade off type thing. between the two. Yeah, that's a good point. I also think I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I have, I have Russ as my, my quarterback one. I have cam as my two. So I need, some kind of quarterback help and you know you're not going to get what you want at quarterback at the 112 but it gives me options like say a herbert goes in the first round and like no one in my league really likes him which is a possibility because like everyone just like talks shit about herbert and everyone's just going to be like oh i'm just not going to take him because everyone else hates him you know so yeah. it's possible that he he falls to me or with that 112 i can move back like five picks maybe grab an extra third and then grab like jalen hurts depending on where he goes at like the two four two five so that that was my thought process for it so it was, it was obviously you know straight up you're going to take sutton over terry of course but i think the other pieces on top of it uh, made me excited about it but yeah i mean denver's going to go with the wide receiver and that's what ultimately kind of scares me a little bit there yep. yeah next team we have which is kind of surprising a pick number 34 the indianapolis colts are plus 140 to take a receiver so it's not you know it's it's the number one it's the highest odds uh the position that they're going to take but everything i've heard is that they just want a guy like jordan love or they want a quarterback to back up philip rivers and have for the future so i honestly don't see a wide receiver going here i could see later in the draft maybe like a michael Pittman or a dpj landing there just a bigger bodied wide receiver to complement the other two but I just don't understand this line. I don't think that they go wide receiver early. Nick, you think that they're going to add somebody like that in the draft? Uh, I, I mean, they they lost almost well, most of their weapons to free agency this year. Um, but I could see them going with a bigger body wide receiver because they lost Ebron, who they loved having and loved using for the last you know bunch of years. And uh, they lost Devin Funches, who didn't play, but clearly the signing of him tells you that they, you know, they have a mold that they want to use in the red zone. They have a mold that they want to see. So I like the Michael Pittman comparison or, you know, uh, landing spot for him. I don't know uh, if they're going to want to use the draft capital after using the second on Paris Campbell this year. Cause I feel like Pittman's a guy that will probably sneak his way in and be, you know, be that like mid second round pick early third round pick or something. So we'll see if they use the capital. Uh, I would be, I would be surprised though um, if they use like early capital on a wide receiver, but if they do, I'd be in agreement with you that they would probably go with some kind of bigger body guy to complement like the TY in the Paris. Yeah. And they have no first round pick and they have two early seconds. So I could just see them packaging that to move into the first and grab a quarterback. If they see a run starting to happen. Yeah. Mike, what do you yeah. feel? Who do you think is a good fit in Indy? If there is any at all. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you guys. I think, like, I think Chris Ballard is a really good GM. I think he's just too smart to blow his early capital on a deep wide receiver running back class. So as much as we want to see people go there, um, I think it's like, like I even put in my like, guess, I think they're going to trade up to, to, get, to get a position of value. All right. Makes sense. Next up, we have the Las Vegas Ra- Raiders at pick number 12. Uh, they're minus 167 to go receiver. We'll just do this quick because we have them in a later part of the episode. I think CeeDee Lamb just fits there. I mean, we saw Amari Cooper kind of struggle, but CeeDee Lamb is a different type of receiver, just like a jump ball, big guy that can win after the catch as well. Um, even though Derek Hart isn't a very good quarterback, we saw some flashes with Tyra Williams, and CeeDee Lamb is just like Tyra Williams. Like, if you play Madden, just bump everything up to, like, 99, and it's just, like, so much better than Tyrell. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to see somebody land in Las Vegas, but just like A.J. Brown last year, sometimes talent just wins out, and they just produce their fantasy in the face of terrible quarterback play and bad coaching. Mike, who do you like in uh, Las Vegas? Uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but it could also be Henry Ruggs, just given the history of that team and <laughs> their obsession with speed. I know, if, yeah, I know if they did take Ruggs, our man Reggie Q would 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 roll over and just just faint. But I think it's definitely a possibility. Or they just hold that pick captive, and someone like Denver moves up, or someone like Philly moves up and snags Henry Ruggs in that spot. No, that would be way too. Um way too savage of a move for Oakland to actually do. I think they're gonna <laughs> yeah, I hope cool. they don't take Henry Ruggs, bro. That would be like they need a real legit wide receiver 
one, like a possession yep. receiver, you know, not like yeah. a, not that Ruggs is a gimmick or a tactic guy, but I, like, I think a Judy would fit so well there or the CD lamb would fit so well there. Yep. And I would love Gruden to get a legitimate wide receiver one who's talented. He, if, if one of those two guys goes to Oakland, like I, they'd actually be on my radar for redraft leagues. You know, they're very, very rarely that you ever target rookie wide receivers in redraft because it just takes them so long into the season to start getting real snap shares and shit. But like, yep. I, whoever lands there would probably start right off the rip with like an 85 to 90% snap share. Right. And they're going to get a lot of targets. So um, yep. one of those guys going there, I would love, I, I just don't think rugs really makes sense for that team. I feel so like rugs is somebody who makes other people around you better. And they don't really have too many weapons. That's to what I mean. Better. They yeah. have like Hunter Renfro and Waller. And that's about it. If they had yeah. like the 12 and the 15 pick and went like Jerry Judy, then Henry rugs, I'd be like, okay, it's kind of like a cool pairing, but you <laughs> can't, you can't have one without the other. You know what I mean? It needs yeah. to preface with a good wide receiver in order to be excited about rugs somewhere. Next up, we have the Minnesota Vikings. They have two later first round picks. They have 22 and 25, and they're plus 250 to go wide receiver. It's their second highest odds. They have cornerback at minus 110, which leads me to believe with one of these picks, they're probably going to go wide receiver. And I think a good fit here would be like a Denzel Mims. You know, end of the first round, a big body receiver to complement Thielen over the middle. It's going to be consolidated target share, like we always see. And an underrated part of Mims' game, or like that's not talked about for fantasy is he's a good blocker and this team wants to run the ball and that's just going to get him on the field early and often as a rookie so I like him I like Justin Jefferson I like Justin Jefferson basically anywhere and although he's a slot receiver we saw Stefan Diggs in his rookie year play the slot and Thielen out wide and then them interchange and I don't think Jefferson is like locked into a slot role like we thought that about AJ Brown but then we saw you know his athleticism and size make him a good outside receiver in the NFL so I like those two guys there. Mike, you prefer anybody in uh, Minnesota? And do you think anybody that's going to go there is going to be better than Stephon Diggs? Uh, no, I don't think anyone's going to be better than Stephon Diggs. But I, I think they would benefit from someone that's a bit more of a field stretcher, like kind of like a Jalen Rager who can play on the outside and kind of stretch the defense a bit because you're not really going to get much of that speed from like Adam Thielen. Um, and then, you know, it really opens up space for the running game as well. So although I might not like that as much for fantasy, uh, I think that probably makes more sense for them. But knowing Minnesota, they're just going to freaking, like, just take defensive players only. I was going to say, I, I almost – I feel like the plus 250 is kind of like a bait. Like, people know Stefan Diggs is, like, a big name, so they just want to make sure that someone else goes in there. And, Mike, I saw you replying to, I think, Graham Barfield's tweet. He was talking about um, the rookie incoming class and the percentage of yards that came from screens yeah. last year. Right, like Diggs has been good, I think, because he gets a lot of those screen plays drawn up for him. And he's a guy who will catch like eight balls for like 56 yards if he doesn't catch a deep ball. They do a lot of design plays. So I also think it makes sense to look at a receiver who can make plays, um, you know, behind the line of scrimmage and them have plays drawn up for them. So looking at the chart, I would probably need a little bit more context or if they have the entire list. But Brian Edwards led the class in terms of the percentage of his yards that came from screens last year at 32%. Brandon Ayuk, I think, is a guy that might make sense because he's at the back half of the first round, and that's where a lot of people kind of project him to go. Where did uh, – do you know what their second-round pick capital uh, is like right now, the Vikings? Uh, I'll check that out. Okay, so it's Edwards, 32, Ayuk, 21. You said Denzel Mims, but he was actually last yeah, on the list. Yeah, he was super low. He was like 160 yards after the catch last year. Well, not even, yeah, it's, it's, this is, this percentage is strictly from screens. So this Denzel Mims has uh, 0% of his production from screens. I don't know if it's what yeah. uh, behind the line of scrimmages, but um, it's it, that again, that could just go to the scheme of the college offense. Just yeah. saying that like, you know, they just didn't do that. And it doesn't they got the 58th make, pick Minnesota yeah, 58th so. and 89. That's all their top hundreds. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of like what, it, what, you know, cause they have a scheme there that they want to run the ball down the fucking throws. And it seemed like Diggs yep. kind of had his role, right? It wasn't like he was an alpha who like created his own fucking plays. It was either cousins hitting him da down deep or them manufacturing short yardage plays for him to make a play. So I think they probably have a player. They're one of the teams that might have a player in mind rather than just like best talent available, you know? So a guy like yep. Brandon, I might make a little bit of sense. So if there was someone I see going back out of the first round playmaker near the line of scrimmage, maybe. Yeah, I can Makes totally sense. see that. Next up, the New York goddamn Jets. Pick number 11, minus 110 to go wide receiver. I, I'm just going to put, like, you could put CeeDee Lamb for, like, all these teams and just fits, but I think he's a good complement to what they have there, which is basically nothing. I was going to say Jerry Judy would be decent there, but I feel like Jamison Crowder, he's not even close to the receiver that Jerry Judy is, but they kind of occupy, occupy a similar role in the short to intermediate game. And Chris Herndon, if that guy ever gets up off the couch and has good hamstrings, he'll kind of take over that same role and Le'Veon Bell out of the backfield. Lamb is just that big body guy that can win down the field. So 
Uh, and they obviously tried to use Robbie Anderson, and that just never worked out. So I think Lamb could just step in, take over that role, see like 100-something targets his rookie year, and be fantasy relevant in the face of a terrible situation. But as we all know, Adam Gase is probably just going to ruin him. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't see how they don't go O-line, man. Like, if they don't go O-line this time, it's just like – it's not a sexy it's pick. Just, it's just, it's just freaking so irresponsible. They're going to go wide receiver. You know what it it's is? So like, irresponsible. It, it's like where every other team you want the best receiver to go there. Like, oh, San Fran's going to take a receiver. Like, I would love to see, you know, C.D. Lamb there, Oakland, C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy. The Jets, it's like, ugh, throw Henry Ruggs there because we could be the least disappointed <laughs> about him going there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want fucking C.D. Lamb going there and then wasting his entire rookie season under Adam Gase. God forbid they win seven or eight games and he keeps his job and then he fucking ruins it for <laughs> another year. Like, I'm sorry, New York, but like build your fucking infrastructure, your team before you start ruining fantasy players for us. So do I, I mean, they're probably going to take a wide receiver early when they're at minus 110. Yeah. yeah. That's literally a fucking coin flip. So yeah, dude, the, the, the 10 to 20 picks are going to be nuts. There are like 42 yeah. teams right there that need a wide receiver. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like I would rather, if I, if I could choose, it would be rugs because that's where he's going to go. <laughs> and because I don't want him uh, ruining any other team. If Ruggs goes there, it would basically be like the Geronimo Allison MVS debate because everything we've been arguing about over the past couple months just goes to nothing if he goes to the Jets because we know he's not going to be good there. I know. It's so bad. I want Ruggs to be good. I feel like in a good spot, I would be okay drafting him in fantasy, but that is yep. absolutely not one of them. And talking Speaking about of good, good spots, spots, Philadelphia Eagles, pick number 21. They're minus 230 to go wide receiver. So the same thing as the Broncos. They're going to move Ruggs, up. Yeah, yep. Ruggs would be good here. I also like Rager here a lot. Mike, what do you think? Would you prefer Rager or Ruggs here? Oh, I would love I would love Rager. Uh, I mean, I like Rager more than Ruggs. So if Rager went there, that'd be that'd be beauty. But if there is one spot that I really want to see Ruggs go, it's if it's not Denver, then it's probably the Philadelphia Eagles. And they already talked about like how they wanted to like trade up, and they didn't think their guy was going to be get there. Like, first of all, I want I want to say it's like fucking irresponsible that they did not sign anyone during free agency. I think that was like just a huge makes no mistake. sense. It makes no sense because you're not going to solve your wide receiver problems with one rookie. Or even two rookies for that matter. How is every team like every team in the top twenty is is favored favorited to fucking <laughs> draft a wide receiver? It makes no sense. So Philly's minus two thirty, San Fran's one seventy seven, New York Jets minus one ten, Raiders minus one sixty seven, Broncos is minus two thirty. So yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fucking wide receivers flying off the board here. I think Philly. I think they're going to trade up. I think they're going to trade up. They have someone in, in their mind. I know we've heard a lot of rumors of rugs. I think CD Lamb is the guy that they really want, and I could totally see them moving up to. Um, I don't even know what other picks are. You know, it's tough. It's like it's hard to move up because all the other teams that they would yeah, move they up want, for they want also too. want wide receivers. Yeah. So Philly, I mean, I would like someone that's kind of well polished, that's been uh, maybe around the college game for a little longer, so that they could step right in and and produce. But really, anyone that goes to Philly, um, I will be targeting because one, you don't often go into a QB situation where the quarterback is at least above average. And you're almost guaranteed targets, right? So if you're going to a team with a good quarterback, usually they have a good, you know, win loss record and they're getting a shitty pick. So you're going in, um, or they, yeah, you know, they have a shitty pick in the first half. You're going in with other weapons around you, but you're going to go in and almost be the alpha with Carson Wentz. So I'm like, that, that makes me super interested. Um, I would like Justin Jefferson going there. I think that would make sense yeah. throwing that big slot role. That'd be beautiful. They'd just like throw five to 10 yard passes all game to him and Ertz and all those guys. So that would be pretty interesting to see, but. Uh, next up, we have the New Orleans Saints at 24, and they're plus 175 to take a wide receiver. Uh, that's their best odds uh, for our position. I don't really know who I see here because I just feel like you can. I just... know. Do you know who's? I know who's going to go here. I put down Ayuk, but I don't know. First name Titty, last name Boy. <laughs> no, <laughs> Titty Boy T Higgins. Put it on the fucking paper right now. Titty Boy is going to end up in New Orleans. He's going to be out in fucking Mardi Gras partying too much. We're going to see videos of him in actual titties everywhere. <laughs> Mark it down. Mark it down, Titty Boy. I would, I, I would like that pair, man. They've been looking for yeah. that big body, something to do something on, on the outside, outside of Michael Thomas being the possession guy. So I actually wouldn't hate T Higgins if, if he, if he went there. I would like that too. I mean, you, you obviously wouldn't have a long way to actually fight to fantasy relevance because you got Manuel Sanders that got signed there too. He's probably going to produce. But uh, long term, I like that as well. Yeah, I'm just not really a fan of T. Higgins. So I, I won't <laughs> slander him. I'm just not going to comment. <laughs> uh, okay. San Francisco right, 49ers. 49ers. Pick 13, minus 177. I don't know. There's talks about them wanting to trade back, but 
I think if they do trade back, an interesting player that they could add is LaVisca Chenault because they want a lot of versatility in that offense. And adding a guy like him who can line up basically anywhere, he's probably going to get hurt doing it. But being able to line up like out wide in the backfield, whatever, just fits Kyle Shanahan's system. It gives them the flexibility to trade back, get him in like the second or third round and accrue more picks. But uh, if they were to stay there, Again, I think just CeeDee Lamb also being pretty versatile and winning after the catch, and that's basically what he built. Kyle Shanahan is building his offensive round, is winning after the catch. I think that would be a really good fit. Yeah, I think, like, the the trick is, like, you already have Debo there that kind of serves that purpose. So it's like you kind of double up on Debo and Visco. Maybe that works. I don't know. But, um, like, that's another spot where I feel like Rager could be pretty cool, um, just like someone that – that actually adds a vertical element to their game because they try to have that with Goodwin. And I don't know if you guys remember, but like when Goodwin was healthy, him Dude, and Jimmy was, G were actually pretty good. I was just about um, to bring that up. I was like, first year Shanahan was there in San Francisco, Goodwin was there, and he went over a thousand yards in scrimmage. He had a thousand yeah. yards that first year. This is where Henry Ruggs makes the most sense to me because he definitely had had a plan for Goodwin and he'd had yeah. that same plan for Henry Ruggs. And Ruggs is definitely a more talented wide receiver than Marquise Goodwin is. I think he would actually fit really well there. So I would like to see Ruggs land in San Fran um I don't you really no you think that they'd move back then they they just traded for that pick yeah they just traded for it but there was reports today that they're looking to trade back because they have 13 and 31 and then they don't have a pick until I think like round six or something yeah maybe they have their eye on multiple wide receivers like maybe they move back they let Philly take that 13 to get rugs move back and take like a fucking LaVisca or Rager at 21 or or 31 wherever they can get that guy so if I mean if they have a multiple guys on that board with around the same grade that would make sense but if there were a team you know like we like Henry Ruggs to Denver but like their style of play doesn't really dictate that Ruggs would fit in that well with that offense you know they're not someone who just like loves chucking the ball deep but I think I think he would thrive in in San Fran just because we've seen Goodwin have a lot of success under Shanahan yeah Yeah, or he could draft a or he could draft the next Dante Pettis and motivate him somewhere (laughs) (laughs) forgot about Dante Pettis Jesus Christ I picked them up off uh the waiver wire in a dynasty league, like during our playoff run, like someone just dropped him. I was like, I guess I'll <laughs> fucking take him, right? Like we'll get like two or more like re- stupid ass fucking buzz reports about Dante Pettis this off season. Maybe I can move him. <laughs> Is Jalen Hurd still there? I haven't heard that name in so yeah. long. Jalen oh, Hurd is still there. We'll get some buzz from him. I, uh, <laughs> I, I like totally forgot he was there too, but yeah, I mean, he missed his whole rookie year. I feel like he's, he's another versatile guy. Like that's also, you know, if, if they drafted Hurts was a um, running back at Tennessee Hurd, Third round pick last year, right? Yeah. Yep. So he's another guy that's almost like uh, I, it makes me think that they probably wouldn't spend capital on like a LaVisca Chenault because yeah. they're um, probably not similar in talent, but similar in like skill set. So if they had an idea for her last year, but they might try it this year. And then, you know, that's why I think they would attack a guy like Ruggs because he would fit into the scheme well. Yeah, her's huge, man. He's like 6'5", 226. He's basically a running back. He's a big girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he took Alvin Kamara's job at Tennessee. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, next up, we have favorites to take quarterbacks. These are kind of obvious. We have Miami at minus 835, and then the Chargers at minus 400. I want the Chargers to take Tua. Everything is leading me to believe that they're going to do whatever they can do to take Tua. But then there's all these reports that they're not going to take Tua. So (laughs) I I just don't even want to talk about it. Dude, when Thursday rolls around and they announce Justin Herbert, I'm just probably just moving (laughs) the stream. This NFL draft is going to be fucking incredible. I cannot wait. For, I cannot wait for this first round. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So Miami at five. Been. Yeah, we got. Uh, is is it what? What are the odds for Joe Burrow at one? Is it just like I think it's minus a hundred thousand. I saw something ridiculous. Minus yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I did see that. And they were like, if you're first time depositing on DraftKings, it's plus two hundred. I'm like, I don't fucking. I'm not even going to clickbait that shit. I'm not even going to entertain your bullshit headline. All right, so we go with the quarterbacks. I think we'll touch on that in the later part, anyways. Yeah. All right, and then running backs, none of them are heavy favorites at all, but the ones with the best odds, anything plus 4,000 or better, are the Falcons at plus 1,600, the Colts at plus 2,000, the Eagles at plus 4,000, which they just spent capital on Miles Sanders, but they did lose Jordan Howard, and then the Buccaneers at plus 1,400. Uh, a lot of these guys are early picks. They have six uh, – Falcons are 16, Eagles are 21, and we already think that they're going to go wide receiver. The Buccaneers are 14. And the Colts are 34. So I think they're the most realistic to go running back. But then again, we talked about them possibly trading up or adding wide receivers. So, uh, Nick, do you see any of these teams adding a running back in the first round? Yeah. Atlanta. It's <laughs> pretty <laughs> 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 fucking stupid. <laughs> no, I'll be, uh, I, I don't see any of these, these teams here. Just because they have, they're in, like, really good position to do it in the second or third round. Like, if, yeah. if these teams didn't have – like all of them have somewhere between the 45 and 55 picks and then also in the 75 range. You know, if they didn't have those picks, I would say maybe if that was like a big position of need, but I don't think there's a, 
a need for them to go that early with one of the picks. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't – I'm not going to bet against surprised. It. I'm kind of surprised that Seattle's not on here. You know, they're at the tail end of the – No, they're tail end of the first. Oh, they are? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be sure. You can never put it by them. I think, I mean, they'll, they'll take a running back soon, but I think like people just got like way too excited about that on Twitter. And we're like, okay, yep, Jonathan Taylor. Every time you hear a report about like a team likes a running back. Oh, there we go. Jonathan Taylor is going to be in that back. You're like, shut the fuck up. I, I hate Twitter. <laughs> so fucking much. I'm sorry. All right. All right that, that's it for the best odds. Now we're going to move on to different players and their DraftKings over under. And then we're going to give our actual predictions and you guys are going to count up how many we got wrong when the draft actually comes around. So, First up, we have Tua Tagovailoa out of Alabama. His over la, 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 la. is five and a half, and the under is minus 167. Teams in that range, five through seven, are Miami, uh, the Chargers, and Carolina. Mike, you have your prediction written down as Miami, so tell me why you hate me. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I just think that he's like – I think all the, all the hoobla and all the noise around him, like falling out of the 10th, is just, is just that. It's a lot of noise. And I think at the end of the day – at the end of the day, like, if you think about, you know, what the Patriots want to build there, like, they want a cerebral quarterback, right? They want the a guy. The Patriots want to build there. Oh, my God. Yeah. What the Patriots want to build there, dude. What, who's their head coach, man? Um, like, they want that cerebral guy. Like, the guy who really – who's, like, uh, to use the freaking shitty phrase, student of the game. And I think we've seen multiple evidence Like, he got points. an 18 on his fucking wonder. Like, he's not a student of anything. <laughs> well uh, – I heard that was wrong. That was a false report. First well, no, I, th I think I think right. 13 was wrong, yeah, because someone took it from, like, his sophomore year of college or something. I don't know. It was, like, a ridiculous report. It doesn't fucking matter either way. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, if we, we, we kind of talked about this in our, like, Tua breakdown, our 360 review, but, like, what he does, like, at the line, just, like, mentally processing stuff, like, how he knows how to throw the routes and stuff like that. I just think he's, like, a great fit. And just, like, Miami's one where, like, look, they're not going to become a playoff contender in one year, so they can afford to actually wait. And if their doctors do the due diligence and think that he is going to recover, I think it's like an easy trigger pull for them there. Yeah, I think, you uh, Miami train? I, I think um, Miami for sure. There's just no way. Like, two is too good of a prospect, and teams realize that quarterbacks win this league. There's no way he drops out of the top five just because he's the upside of having a franchise quarterback is just way too juicy to let that – pass up because you're you know you're scared of injury like so what like anyone could be fucking injured i know he's coming in with injury concerns but tua could literally be you know the next drew Brees, or the next whoever you want him to be you know as that kind of upside and you just don't let that fall out of the top five so i'm not going to go with like specific teams right now i would go to miami because they're in the best position and they're the ones that need a quarterback right now um but yeah i'll go to a definitely under on that yeah for me i put the charges i mean that report came out that like telesco doesn't want injured players yet he put the franchise tag on hunter henry it makes zero <laughs> sense to me so if they could trade the entire draft picks that they have for Tua, I would do that. But they're probably just going to take Herbert, who we have up next. His over-under is also at five and a half. And the last time I checked, his odds were minus 130 for over and minus 130 for under. So uh, it's an even line. Miami, the Chargers, Carolina are also – Vegas is so fucking – That's so bad. That's so fucking annoying. Like, Vegas just gives you no juice anywhere. They're just like, they're just like this is, looks good, so we're going to take your money here, but we're also going to take your fucking money here. <laughs> Uh, Mike, you have him as Chargers. We flip flopped. I have him in Miami. I'm just trying to speak things into existence, Mike. When you started talking about two to <laughs> the Dolphins, I, I like, say, shut your mouth. Cried. Like I felt so bad about that. Like I felt something <laughs> in my chest, and I just like had to look away. So uh, I really don't want to talk about this, to be honest. <laughs> That's yeah, incredible. I mean, <laughs> look, it, there is a chance. Look, there is a chance. We see like NFL GMs do this all the time, and they just go up and grab their guy, and maybe someone trades up with the Lions at three and takes Herbert, you know, and he's gone. And then somehow the Chargers move up a couple spots and land Tua. But as is, like, without trying to predict all those trades, I think, you know, they're just going to have to take a shot on Herbert because as much as Anthony Lynn thinks Tyrod is the future, I'm sure <laughs> we all God, know that Ty, Tyrod, is, Ty God is not the future. Um, but what would be even more interesting, though, is if they just totally pass on Her Herbert and just grab uh, – grab Hertz later and put him behind Tyrod. I would Trey. love if they just get Simmons or an offensive tackle and then just draft uh, Hertz later. Like, I would love that. If they if they pass on that and then get, like, Fromm or Eason, I'm back out. But if they get a Hertz, <laughs> I, I would like that. Just to experiment with a mobile quarterback for the first time in, like, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be uh, – every, every part of this draft is going to be – I feel like picks 6 through 10 are going to be boring as shit. But 1 through 5 is going to be fun. 10 through 20 is going to be wild. 
That's going to be good. like snacks. My fandom is like legitimately on the line. We'll move away from that. We have Jordan Love. His over under is quick on the over unders. All right, 19 and a half. I have him going to New Orleans at pick number 24. Mike has him at Indy. I just think he's a guy that's got to sit right away. And whether it's behind Drew Brees or Phil Rivers, I think that would really help his development. Yeah, I think he's yep. going to go over that too. I think, I mean, I don't think, I, I don't see a team trading up for him. If anything, it's going to be one of the teams in the 20s. I think that would take a, a Jordan Love type. So definitely over on 19 and a half. Yep. Right. Uh, we're going to skip the rest of the quarterbacks because they all stink and their over unders are pretty late. Uh, then we have CD Lamb at 12 and a half. The under is minus 125. We already touched on this. I think he might just go to the Jets at pick number 11. So bet the under. Uh, you'll probably be wrong because I'm a terrible gambler. Uh, <laughs> that, that fit, I mean, anybody in the in New York Jets are kind of shit because of Adam Gase. So I wouldn't be too happy about that, but I'd hope that his talent uh, overrides the situation. Yeah, I got him going to the Raiders. I'm assuming that New York Jets didn't take an O-line, but, you know, I guess knowing the Jets, we just don't know. They might just fucking blow it on the wide receiver anyways. Right, yeah, yep. I think uh, I think we're going to see a few of these teams in that top 15 that are supposed to take wide receivers just not take the wide receivers. And I I, I feel like the smart money would probably just to be to hit over on all three of those, and you'll pro- probably hit two out of three. I don't really – you know, it's so fucking hard to say which teams like which players. Yeah. But uh, I'd like – trades. Yeah, I'd like to say that CD's probably the first wide receiver off the board. So if there was going to be one under that I felt comfortable with, it would probably be CD as the under there. Yeah, Jerry Judy has the same over under, but he has better odds at minus 134, higher odds to go under at minus 134. I think he's just a good fit for the Raiders. Maybe it's the people I follow. They're just all Raiders fans, but it just seems like they think that he's going to uh, end up in Las Vegas. I think he'd be a pretty good fit there. Mike, we flip-flopped again. You have him going to the Jets. Yeah, what were exactly. the odds on? Uh, what were the odds on Arizona? They, they weren't, didn't have good odds to go wide receiver first round? Uh, they did, but I think it was like plus something. It was, uh, yeah. wasn't a favorite. It's okay. not as good, yeah. Okay, because there was so much hype with them taking one at nine, which is, like, is dumb as fuck. They should just take yeah. a, a tackle or something. I mean, there's like some that. rumors that they're trading Christian Kirk to the Cowboys. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but if they wow. do, then that opens it up again for them to land like a you know CD, CD plus uh, new Hopkins. That would be extremely interesting, but also like just keep Kirk and use your ninth overall fucking pick <laughs> yeah. on a tackle. You know? Yeah, exactly. All right. Next up, Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs. Uh, we got him at Denver, obviously, over under 13.5. Uh, you said Denver. I said Denver or Philly via trade. Um, I mean, I think those are probably likely scenarios for him. The San, San Fran has 13, right? Yeah. Yeah, San Fran has 13. Yeah, that's so, the only thing I would make me nervous. Yeah. Um, if three receivers go 11, 12, 13, do you think it's just going to be like all hell break loose, just a crazy wide receiver run? <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, I, don't, I, th- I there's just no way that's going to happen. That's why I'm like, I might as well just take the over on it. I highly, there's no fucking way that they go 11, 12, 13. But we also saw like fucking Corey Davis go off the board sixth overall that year. And like, <laughs> we know. saw that year with like Laquan Treadwell, Josh Doxson, like Will Fuller all going a row. It's like, what are you doing? This is, you know what I mean? Like, the draft is just so ridiculous and none of us really have any fucking idea what's going to happen. So it's fun, like, projecting this, especially with all the reports about everyone loving all these wide receivers. But, um, I w- I guess if I had to put my money down, I would go with the over on rugs. I think at the end of the day, teams probably like Lamb and Judy more, even though there is hype, uh, you know, a lot of hype around rugs. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Next up, we have Justin Jefferson over under of 21 and a half. The under is the favorite at minus 150. And Nick, we were talking about this, and I if, like initially thought that was way too crazy to think he's going to go within the top 20 picks or around there. But the more I looked at it and like his profile and just how good of a player he is and him being that big slot, which the NFL is moving towards. I could see him going 20th overall to Jacksonville. And I think Mike and I both believe that they may be tanking for Trevor Lawrence or they really don't have an option anymore. They gave up everybody on defense and all they have is, you know, DJ Chark and Leonard Fournette. So uh, the ability to have Justin Jefferson and Chark for a Lawrence or Fields next year to have a solidified wide receiver core is going to help him transition to the NFL. So I could see them adding him at uh, pick number 20. Yeah, I think it's just like a, I think it's a great transition year, right? Because they're selling off like all their defensive assets. So, you know, they're not really trying to go for it. But also you get a quick look into like if Gardner Minshew is any good. You know, I mean, I think he's pretty good. But at the end of the day, he's still like a late round draft pick. They have not much invested in him. So they can kind of use this year as a testing ground. It's like, hey, look, we gave you these weapons. Prove to us you're worth it. And then if not, just punt them and then move on to the next quarterback. Yeah, because they, I mean, they just got rid of Marquise Lee today, which whoever tweeted out said it came as a big surprise. Marquise hey, Lee and Rap Sheet. <laughs> he's played like one game over the last three years. I don't know why. Rappaport said he was a big contributor to that offense. Yeah. But he might have had 42 receiving yards since he came into yeah. the league. So I don't know why I was surprised, but it seems like every year Jacksonville just 
takes they're like a fucking a black hole it's like draft a wide receiver and somehow that receiver just falls through the black hole and then the next year they're fucking drafting a wide receiver again so I, I, the reason i would take the under here is because i see philly sitting there at 21 and that makes yep. the most sense to me if they move up though and get like a cd then i yeah. don't know if, then i don't know if i feel comfortable with someone taking um jefferson there i just feel like jacksonville has so many other fucking needs i mean like yep. wide receiver of course they they do need players but I don't know. Like, if, if you're going to be tanking, I don't, I don't know if, like, wide receiver is really a, a, a position that you want to, like, solidify right now. There's no well, that's a good line. tank. That's a good tank position, right? Because, like, wide receivers don't develop your one. Like, they're not really contributing much, and it's not like they're winning any games. Yeah, you're um, just – you. Have, I have no logic behind it. I just, like, don't want a wide receiver to go to Jackson, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> the only thing they need the most is God right now. So, that's the only yeah. thing I can save them. We have DeAndre Swift, the over under at 26 and a half. The over is the favorite. I think it's the first one on here. Uh, minus 167. Mike and I both have them going to Miami at 26. They have so many picks in this draft. They have so much draft capital. I don't think it's going to hurt them to take a running back at the end of the first. And if they are rebuilding, have him on a cheap contract for four or five years. What was J.K. Dobbins' number? He wasn't on there. They only had yeah. Swift and Taylor. The fuck? Yeah. They had Cole Komet, though, but not, no J.K. Dobbins for game makers. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right. Um, I would... I don't know. I uh, I don't know why, but something really is telling me that it's going to be Dobbins over over Swift. You know, we like what I haven't heard. Have you guys heard any reports of 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 the Dolphins like having a lot of interest in Swift? I haven't heard anything like actually personally connected between the two. No, no, it's definitely been more reports on the Dobbins side. But they did meet with Swift uh, and Taylor. They didn't meet with Dobbins though, from what I remember. Okay, because yeah, um, Dobbins can only do the bench press anyway, so they didn't really care about him. Yeah. <laughs> But I was listening to PMT and they were interviewing Daniel Jeremiah and they were saying an interesting fit could be Baltimore at 28. And I think that would be crazy if they add a running back. That offense would be insane. And then just add a guy like Brian Edwards later in the draft. Like Lamar Jackson's the 101 in a one quarterback league. Like I don't care. That would that that's a that's definitely a spot that people are probably overlooking that would would probably use an early round pick on a on a running back. I like the spot to Baltimore because Ingram's contract's gonna be up after this year. Yep. Uh, as much as we like Justice Hill, I mean, they they did not play the guy at all during his rookie season, which tells you that he's, you know, slowly developing or he's not taking it seriously or they just saw something that they don't really like in him. Um, we'll see if he gets a little more play time this year. But if they take an early round running back this year, that guy is probably going to be the future of that backfield. Yeah. Jonathan yeah. Taylor and the Baltimore Ravens would be fucking beauty. It'd be fucking Jamal Lewis 2.0. <laughs> His over-under is actually at 37 and a half and I'm surprised because what he did in college and what he did at the combine like I know the NFL is slowly starting to devalue running backs but pick 37 and a half like Ezekiel Elliott <laughs> went four. Weird. Leonard Fournette went four. Like why wouldn't this guy go top 20 unless these GMs just all of a sudden realize that they shouldn't draft a running back early. He's just not that versatile. Like that's what it, that's what it really is. Like I, I feel like we just keep their fantasy people just keep trying to jam him into their prospect models. And like when you have the production that he has, of course he's going to fly up those ratings every time. But I don't. I, I just I don't know if teams view him as a three down back. That's that's kind of the Leonard, problem. But Leonard Fournette wasn't uh well like wasn't that versatile. He, he, he caught a lot college. of balls. He caught a lot of balls in college. Caught some. I don't know if he caught how much did he catch. <laughs> he, caught some. he did. He was he was a pretty he was pretty heavy in the pass game, I believe. Let's look that up. Live fact check. Yeah, we'll live see. fact check Let's right here. He's a fucking farce live on. Okay, on yeah. So he has less than he has less than Jonathan Taylor. So he had ten. He had seven, nineteen, and fifteen. What so. do you mean? Well, his his college target share was in the eighty fifth percentile. Yeah, LSU just doesn't throw the ball at all, or they didn't used to. Yeah, oh yeah, in terms of raw receptions, share, yeah. yeah. But in terms of yeah, like yeah. how involved he was per his actual passing game, he yeah, was yeah. very involved. But I mean, either way, like, uh, I I just think teams look at him and probably don't see him as a three down bat. Like there's no other, there's no other explanation. Yeah. For it, I right? mean, that could be definitely be it. You know, like there's not like they look at him and they're like, Oh, he didn't produce in college. Like he's fucking all he did was produce <laughs> in college, you know? So yeah, um, th that would be my, my thing. So uh, people being like, you know, he's the unquestioned one one I thought was a fucking ignorant take from the start. If you had him at the RB one, that's fine. But the fact that it was like, he's the most elite prospect we've ever fucking seen. And if you think otherwise it's like ignorant, but like the NFL is telling you that they like other running backs better. So I think you also yeah. have to, you know, even Taylor can still be RB one, but you need, it's a range of outcomes. I think for all these players. Yeah, you know? for sure. It's probably a little bit of that, a little bit of workload and a little bit of uh, the fumbles. Yeah. yeah. And the landing spot we have is Indianapolis. And if he goes there behind that offensive line, it's going to be tough for me to not put him RB one. It depends obviously where Swift and Dobbins go, but you know, other teams around that range, 35 to 39 are Detroit, the giants, the chargers, Carolina, Miami, we think Miami's going to add a running back. I don't expect the Detroit Lions to add Jonathan Taylor that early, spend that much on a draft capital on a running back. So I think Indianapolis 
in that range is the only team that kind of makes sense. But then again, we also think that they're going to trade up. So it's be interesting to see where JT goes. I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be surprised if JT goes to Detroit. I feel yeah. like, yeah, I feel like that could, that could totally happen. Like if they're, I mean, they're, they might use an early round pick on a running back and if Taylor's there, like why, why not take him? You know, like you think like, okay, like if you just said objectively Detroit uses their second round pick on a running back, you wouldn't be that surprised, but it's more surprising that like Taylor falls that far in the draft. You know what I mean? So what about I mean, if JT goes to the Chargers? Because they only have Eckler, and then next year uh, Jackson's a restricted free agent. They can have a really cheap running back core of two really good guys that complement each other well. That would be so weird. I don't know how I would like that for fan. I don't know where I would be drafting them because you'd you'd have to assume that Taylor gets almost like no involvement in the passing game if that's the case, right? Yeah, it'd be yeah. like Melvin Gordon's role without pass catching work at all. Yeah, it's Probably. ugly. That could get ugly quick. That would be not good. And you know Eckler's there for the next the handful Four of years. years I think. Yeah, so that, that I, I wouldn't, I mean, that would be really shitty from a fantasy perspective, I think, for Taylor. Man, we could talk about Cole Komet because he's the only one, <laughs> he's the only tight end here. Uh, he was at 44 and a half. The over under, the over was at 183. So they expect him to be um, picked Not after drafted. four. Yeah, they basically expect every tight end here to be undrafted. So I think we'll dive into tight ends a little more as they come up during the draft to yeah. so give more uh, context on it because we don't want to start diving into guys who are like third and fourth round picks who won't develop for three or four years. So, fuck yeah. That. But I just, I mean, I just don't see it with Cole Komet, man. I just see like a worse Kyle, Kyle Rudolph kind of. I mean, no teams took meetings with me either, so that's like another sign there. Um, but yeah, I think more interesting, maybe just look at like the the positional breakdown. So the teams that met most with QBs, you got uh, Tampa Bay Chargers, New England uh, had four visit, four visits. Atlanta, New York Giants, Green Bay Packers, uh, Raiders, Redskins, and Saints each had three. I mean, it's kind of weird, right? Because Miami didn't meet with anyone. But I think at the same time, if you know, like you're at the top of the draft, like there's like only like two options, really. So it's not. I like think you like also have to. Th- I think you also maybe have to factor into these um, a little bit of a uh, pinch of salt, just because we didn't have this time, you know, the last like month or so where teams can meet with players. So this, yeah. we, what we what we could have done if they even had the charts available were like to compare it to last year and see if like the volume was like five times the amount. Cause I'm sure so many meetings probably happened like from now over the last three weeks, which we didn't yeah. really get, you know, get to see. So maybe Miami would have waited until, you know, the last couple of weeks to get to a physical done and then go meet with them in person or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and exactly. the point for that is, if you look at the wide receivers, the Buffalo Bills are second with 11 meetings, but then they traded for Stephon Diggs, and Arizona was third with eight meetings, then they got DeAndre Hopkins. So I think you're right, Nick, in saying that they probably met early on and didn't have the opportunity to meet with more quarterbacks later on in these offseason programs because of the coronavirus, obviously. So, yeah, of these yeah. teams, uh, I don't know. I, I'm going to put this evil on you, Nick. I think the Falcons are going to take Jacob Eason and just have him <laughs> sit behind Matt, uh, Matt Ryan, and then when he's gone, just – You'll see. You'll see the pain. Oh, uh, I mean, I'm fine with with a like. We're, Ryan's going to be our quarterback for the next like three or four years. So I'm not. I'm not about to get like upset about a quarterback that we're going to have sitting on our bench. You know what I mean? Maybe he can develop into something good. I don't really fucking know. Do you think <laughs> the quarterbacks there though, like the three, the Washington meeting with three, the Giants meeting with three? I almost feel like that's just a like the tweet that surfaced today about David Gettleman yeah. wanting someone or whatever. Like that's just a, a horrible, horrible like rumor to get people to want to trade up or something like there's no way the fucking yeah. giants are going to take a quarterback that early um yeah. it seems like just a leak report i feel like these teams le- meet with these quarterbacks just to have people thinking that you know oh we have to trade up or else we're not going to get our guy or some shit david get probably just butt dialed him to be honest like there's no reason that <laughs> counts as a quarterback. yeah, That's yeah. if they trying to lay that trap like the saints did by putting a first round tender on uh, fucking Taysom hill <laughs> yeah so the, the quarterbacks will will talk about i guess more as they happen to but i think from the running backs perspective yeah you see some some heavy volume with atlanta tampa bay obviously those two teams need running backs i'm, I'm curious though like atlanta obviously needs like a workhorse because we're not gonna have Gurley long term we don't have freeman anymore um tampa bay I, I wonder if the majority of the running backs that they met with were like the workhorse types or if they were looking get backs yeah, like the even like the Darrington Evans, I, w- I think he'd be a great fit there. Someone that would be like maybe like the James White role for yeah. Tom Brady, or do they want to give Ronald Jones the work? And then you have Houston also meeting with 11. But again, that probably goes to the fact that they met with these guys prior to getting David Johnson. So. Yeah, which is wild because they also spent a third round pick on fucking Duke Johnson before that. So <laughs> it's been some crazy things. It's Billy, baby. It's, it's yeah. Billy O. <laughs> Billy O. B. Clyde uh, Edwards Alaire, probably a decent fit there, though, at, at Tampa Bay. Yeah, I think that's several. 
Yeah, that's, that's I'm pretty much just retired, to be honest, if he's trying to get blocked by uh, Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think the other thing to note here, too, I remember tweeting this out. It's not on here, but the tight ends. I think uh, New England met with six different tight ends, and yep. I think no other NFL team met with more than three or two, maybe. Yeah, it was so, super low on the chart. I just didn't even add it. Yeah, so th- that's, uh, that's something to kind of keep an eye on. We're probably going to see some kind of tight end. Hopefully, it's a pass catching one go to uh go to new england obviously they're not gonna have brady anymore and we don't know what their quarterback situation is gonna be like i mean i do because i know cam newton's gonna be their starter week one <laughs> you guys didn't know that yet um, but cam newton's thrown to the tight end new england have, has used tight ends in their past so i'm interested to see who ends up landing there yep and then for wide receivers we have new england with 12 visits new england just visited everybody like i don't they visited like every position the most um and then we have buffalo at 11 but we kind of touched on that we think that's probably because it's before the stefan diggs trade uh, Philly and the Giants at 10 visits, Arizona at eight, but also DeAndre Hopkins is now there. And then Denver and San Francisco at seven visits. Anybody stand out? Any of those teams stand out for you guys? Uh, yeah, I mean, Philly's obvious. Um, it's kind of weird that New England's meeting with a bunch of wide receivers, but it could just be they're trying to fill up the depth. I think they lost Philip Dorsett, right? So you need, kind of need some of those role players back, and Edelman's like 99 years old. So maybe they'll draft the next Edelman and Lynn Bowden Jr., man. We'll see. Maybe they'll draft Brandon and I because the only time that Nikhil Harry can produce is when he's playing. (laughs) (laughs) That would actually be really funny if Ayuk and Harry were on the same field. Yeah, that was the same thing with Atlanta on that chart. It was like all we did was fucking meet. We we met with like 92 players in like a one-week span. It's like we better fucking come out of this draft with at least two good players. Two more than we usually come away with. I also think the Giants are kind of interesting too because they don't have like an actual outside receiver. They have like Golden Tate, Sterling Shepard, like – Corey Coleman used to be an outside receiver. I don't know what he is anymore. And then Evan Ingram has talked about being traded. Or Maybe they just get Depot, Chase bro. Claypool and just, like, make him a tight end. Who? Yeah. Chase Claypool? Chase Claypool. No, to where? To the Giants. To the Giants? I, that would actually be an interesting. I actually kind of like Caden Smith, the dude that was behind Evan Ingram as a tight end. I think yeah. he's interesting. Just a solid, like, seven catches for 52 yards and maybe a touchdown. Goat, <laughs> fucking goat, goat numbers. <laughs> yeah, uh, they can uh, draft Henry Ruggs at number four, like Pro Football Focus said. I can't wait till Ruggs goes like top three overall in the draft. <laughs> like John Ruggs. Yeah, like, the Chargers take Henry Ruggs. <laughs> no. That'd be amazing. Um, okay, that's that's all we have for today's episode, right? Yep. All right, cool. So um, obviously, if you want to watch us during the live stream, that'll be tomorrow. We also stay in touch through our discord server which is now officially closed for you motherfuckers because we went over a thousand people in the channel uh if you are a patreon member on big dogs already and you are not in discord make sure that you hit one of us up on twitter or uh email or whatever because from now on anyone getting into the discord has to be through patreon patreon.com slash bdge the discord is fucking popping though it's people talking about football all the time the, the, there's a thousand fifty people in there and i think a thousand forty five of them probably like football more than i do so it's it's a fantastic <laughs> little group chat for for everyone that wants to talk about anything dynasty trade talks you can throw your rosters in there get opinions and uh, we got big dogs dynasty league starting up so if you're itching after the nfl draft to get into a dynasty league this is how you do it. We got paid leagues. We got free leagues. We got every kind of fucking league you could possibly do. What do we think, boys? I think that's a good way to end it. I also think we should plug this beautiful piece of yeah. merch. Oh, I didn't even <laughs> see it. That does look fucking pretty. It does Damn. look very good. I like it. It's a beauty. Mine's in the wash because it fucking stained all my clothes. A bunch of black shit on it. So, um, But y'all can go shop on BigDogsFantasy.com. Again, make sure you sign up for Patreon. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Graph Week, baby. One more day. One more day.